so many reasons for why to grow hemp right now and always. It grows in so many different climates and places and soil types and it is a reparative crop. It has been used in sites like Chernobyl and pulled heavy metals from the soil. To plant in sites that have been nuclear test sites or farmed conventionally for many years, and that it is actually cleaning the soil, it's a miraculous crop for that reason. This is what you used to do to me when I was a kid. But a little kid. Wow, I think I must have been much better at it than, than I am now. No, it's perfect. Oh, wonderful. Great, ready? Ready to go. It's an important thing to be a farmer today because we fell out of sync with nature. And right now we're experiencing a lot of the damage and the collateral effects of that. We have to go around, no? We might be able to shimmy through. <laughs> sure. <laughs> It really is amazing right now. Marijuana and hemp are both cannabis. The main difference is that marijuana has above 0.3% THC, and that really is a legal distinction. Hemp has been used for millennia as part of what we grow. But hemp hasn't been grown here, specifically in New York, since 1937. And since that time, we have implemented industries that are really destructive and exploitive. We often think of climate change as smokestacks and all of the fossil fuels that we're burning. And we forget about the land we're interacting with. In farming, that happens to be about 50% of the Earth's surface and there's so much industrial agriculture happening on that farmland. Our country is polluted right now with conventional farms that have been farming the same land with the same crop for years and years and years. The practice of getting there is really hard on the earth. It is more about treating the plant more like a machine. Feed it the right inputs to make a transaction happen. What happens when you grow the same crop year after year on the same land is that same crop is demanding the same nutrients from the soil, and the soil can no longer give those nutrients to the plant because it itself is not living soil at that point. It is dead, and so at this farm, we focus on an integrated crop rotation, meaning we use multiple crops in rotation with one another. And hemp has entered that crop rotation. We believe that regenerative agriculture can actually create the next industrial revolution. And there's real power in hemp as a key player in that paradigm shift. In 2014, it was written back into the Farm Bill. Now we can use hemp not only as a vehicle for medicine, food, fiber, even as far as biodiesel. But within that, we have the opportunity to reverse the damage and replenish the earth. If you can change the way that conventional farmers are farming in this country and introduce hemp as a vehicle to do that, we can change the earth. The guy who lent this to us specifically <laughs> told us not, not to, to do this. this. He's like, don't push anyone. <laughs> okay, he's the okay. person. No, get it. Get out. Get out. Oh my god, get out. He's seeing us. Okay. Oh, he's never gonna lend us a dragon again. September, right now, is really the height of our harvest. The buds are just ready to be taken from the ground and hung to dry.
Regenerative agriculture means that you're going beyond sustainability to replenish ecosystems and nurture biodiversity. And a regenerative farm is measured by the amount of carbon you are sequestering. It is something that you can track and it is something quantitative. That is the power of regenerative agriculture. It can pull carbon from the air and bring it back into the earth. Hemp fits into a regenerative system beautifully because it can do that and we can still use the fibers. We can still even potentially use the flowers. We're feeding our soil. That is always what we are trying to do. And when we came here and began implementing these systems, cover cropping, crop rotations, animal grazing, that shifts the land, but it takes time. It doesn't just happen overnight. You're learning every season what to do. So we harvest them, then we break down the plant, which is a process known as bucking. Once we've done that, they hang here to dry. Once we've dried this, we'll take them down and we'll further break it up, removing ultimately the buds and flowers from the stems and the stalk, because that is, and the leaves. That's the matter that we will be extracting from. And when people talk about industrial hemp and all of the industrial uses, that's for paper, Textile, this is made from hemp. <laughs> the inside of certain BMWs use hemp because it's so strong and also so light. As well as uh, hemp wood, which is great building material along with hempcrete, hemp fiberglass. We could build a whole house from hemp. Our first experience with cannabis was cannabis hanging in our closets as a kid. We both grew up in agriculture. Our father owned a farm in the Berkshires called Equinox. My name is Ted Dobson. The name of my farm is Equinox Farm. I'm a green grower. We would spend our summers cutting alongside a very large crew, and of course we're the youngest ones doing this. <laughs> Oh, God. It becomes this full body experience of cutting greens. Your body is the machine, yes. is the tool, is really. the tool. And this is the best tool that there ever was. Our father was growing primarily specialty greens and other veggies, but he also grew cannabis. was sort of wrong and not what was happening in the closets of my friends. There was like a stigma and shame around that. It conjured, taking, yeah, what did it, well, fear too. But we justified it because we understood and I think a broader sense that he was trying to pay bills. Because it's not easy making a livelihood as a farmer. Along with that, the average age of a U.S. farmer is about 60 years old. And they're male. And they're male. And they're white. And they're white. And so part of that is that the narrative must progress. We must continue to eat, to feed ourselves, to clothe ourselves, to house ourselves, to create medicine. But there's opportunity right now to create a new space for how farming exists and who it exists for. I think this is where all the real medicine is. We just haven't even thought about it yet. <laughs> we are so focused on the flower and the money that came from the flower that no one thought about the roots. We'll find a way to sustainably harvest them on our farm that can feed us and continue to feed the soil. And this farm, when it was purchased five years ago, talk about s dead soil. I mean, this was dirt. And mm -hmm. you can tell in this soil, I mean, I was just noticing the earthworms that were existing in here, which is a sign that your soil is alive. 
but this comes at a result of healthy farming. When it comes down to it and you are standing in a field of hemp that wouldn't have been possible years prior, there's a gratitude that makes this work easy and natural. When I think of Freya, I think of coffee in the morning. She's always there for people in her life. She is thoughtful in a way that embodies giving a gift, but it is her language of giving that is so natural to her. Melanie, since I've known her, which is met her when I was zero, <laughs> um, she's always been bold and outspoken. You know, I have to always remind her, like, you have to drink water and you have to feed yourself. But she is such a martyr to this work, and she's always been that way. My mission is cannabis and hemp. And whenever I feel fear, I remember that I'm not working for anyone or anything. It is for a plant, and it is for what the plant can bring to our soil and to our culture as a whole. Wow, so here are the volunteer plants. This seed came from plants that we harvested last year, and the seed voluntarily spread here and germinated over the winter. And this, we didn't plant. This is totally random. We haven't fed them. We haven't watered them. There's no irrigation here. They're totally on their own, and they're doing their thing. This plot embodies the idea that weed wants to grow. It wants to be alive. It wants to share its fruit. And it wants to be alive here in New York, a place that for the past 80 years, it has not been cultivated. And it really rings true to the name weed. It is a true weed. I mean, here we are in real weeds, and there is weed. <laughs> it's exciting to also yeah. see the other wild plants that we're so used to in this yeah. bioregion, like clover and dandelion, grass, and then to see cannabis as one of these plants. It shows that we are part of an evolving landscape and yeah. that just as much as the landscape forms us, we form the landscape, and there's a meditation between the two. I think women right now are rising up and speaking out. And in many ways, that's what the earth is doing. Every day, it seems like there is something else that is in turmoil with our mother earth. And if we listen to that, if we listen to those signs, if we see what is happening, we can act, we can begin to give back, we can give lend to her voice, to our voice. And I think women are ultimately the ones that are gonna lead that movement. As givers, it is so natural for us to want to give to the earth, the ultimate mother. The world is saying, pay attention to me. Pay attention to the finite resources that you are extracting from, that you are isolating. Pay attention that they are finite and they are part of something that is infinite. And that work feels very inherent. In my bones, I've known and my father known and my mother knew and perhaps my grandparents knew and it's reviving in me now in the state of our earth. Our children and our children's children will also inherit these systems. 
So if we can do the work, the good work now, perhaps it won't look so grim when they are here. Hey guys, I'm Maya May, host of Weathered here on PBS Terra. We hope you enjoyed this episode, which is part of PBS's Earth Month celebration. And if you want more, we'd like to recommend you check out a new episode on India, Alaska on the first marijuana cafe in the United States. There's a link in the description. We hope you enjoy it and the rest of PBS's Earth Month lineup.